This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. You probably remember that last week we started to talk about this particular section of Scripture in Mark 16. Uh, take a look at uh, what the verse says. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. These, of course, are uh, the words of our Lord as uh, he sends his apostles out in the Great Commission, the Divine Commission. He sends them out to baptize. I recognize that this subject is controversial in some circles, but I think it's very easy to understand the purpose and the significance of it from what is taught here. And what we started to do last week was talk about five different views that uh, folks have placed upon this particular passage. I also said last week that uh, it's been my experience with people who have no uh, background in religious things, have never attended churches and things like that, so that they're not indoctrinated in certain views. When I ask someone to just simply read that verse with regard to baptism, uh, I've never had anybody come to any other conclusion than simply what Jesus says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. With the influence of different viewpoints on that subject, people have a difficult time understanding the verse. But the verse is not difficult to understand. And let's just jump right into it then. The, remember the first viewpoint that we presented to you last week is this. He who believes and is baptized will not be saved. Now that obviously is the position of an atheist, or it would be the position of a, of a Jew who doesn't believe in Jesus, or a Muslim, or any other group that doesn't see Christ as our Savior. But those who accept the authority of Jesus certainly do accept this teaching. In John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Christianity is exclusive in its claims to a relationship to God. And without apology, we say that's, that's the way that it is. Um, some you know, famous uh, author and preacher once said that uh, religion, uh, all religions are like climbing a mountain. You may go up on this side, or you may go up on that side, or you may go up on another side, but eventually we're all going to get to the same place, to the top. And that's, that's just not true. It's only through Christ. The second position that we pointed out last week was, he who does not believe and is not baptized will be saved. This is the view of the universalists. And uh, most people don't take this viewpoint too seriously until, <laughs> until somebody dies. And then um, it's, it, it bothers me when, uh, um, l let's say, a celebrity who uh, lived an immoral life, who had multiple wives, was known for his womanizing, um, was not a nice guy, he was a great actor, and when he dies, everybody says, oh, he's smiling, looking down upon us now. That's the universal concept, the universalist concept of, of what Jesus says here. And, and you know that that is not true. Not everyone goes to heaven. Not everyone is going to be saved. Here's the third view. He who does not believe and is baptized will be saved. Now, look at this carefully. He who does not believe and is baptized will be saved. That's putting too much emphasis on baptism. And this is the view that is held by those who believe in infant baptism. 
by baptizing babies. And uh, in fact, it's a, it's a misnomer to say that you baptize a baby when you sprinkle water or pour water on the child's forehead because that doesn't fit the mode of baptism. Uh, many different groups do something like this. But sprinkling or pouring instead of immersion is not baptism in the first place. So to tell you the truth in a loving way, we need to understand that faith is a prerequisite to baptism. Uh, let me give you an example of that here in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but he went on his way rejoicing. So here, here's one of those passages of Scripture that makes it very clear. He had been taught about Jesus, and he'd been taught about baptism. When you, when you teach Jesus, you teach baptism because uh, of its significance in God's plan of salvation. So he'd been taught that, and now they come to a place where there's enough water for him to be immersed. And he says, look, here, I can be baptized. If you believe, you can be. See how that fits in perfect harmony with Mark 16, 16. Baptism is, is to follow someone's faith or belief. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 says, with, with the mouth confession is made, resulting in salvation. Uh, if, if with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, with the mouth he confesses. So it, it's absolutely essential that someone believe before they are baptized. And baptism must be performed by immersion in water. There's no example of sprinkling or pouring or any other method to be found in all of the New Testament. Every act of conversion involves baptism by immersion because that fits the symbolic action of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4 says, or, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptiz baptism into his death as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. It must be immersion. You don't immerse babies. When the traditions of men are taught, sprinkling or pouring, it takes one away from the design found in Scripture. And you remember, Jesus condemned that kind of thought process in Matthew chapter 15, verses 3 through 9, where he condemned the Pharisees for teaching the traditions of men rather than the commandments of God. There are no scriptural precedences for baptizing children. One must believe. We'll look at the uh, fourth view when we come back in just a minute. Here's the fourth viewpoint people take on Mark 16:16. 16, 16. He who believes and is not baptized will be saved. Look, look at that carefully. He who believes and is not baptized will be saved. Now, there's a lot of folks that believe this. This is uh, the position that is held by those who believe in salvation by faith only. People who say that it's not necessary to be baptized. If you have if you just have faith. Now what you'll hear on the television from the TV evangelists, with the exception of this one right here, is put your hand on the TV and let Jesus come into your heart and you'll be saved. That's all you gotta do. All you gotta do is confess him. And that, my dear friends, 
is simply not the truth. You have to take into consideration the rest of what the New Testament teaches with regard to salvation. And it, it, it ignores what Jesus says right here to fall into that position. Some teach that you are saved before baptism and that baptism is just not essential to salvation. But, but Jesus teaches clearly the opposite of that. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, when Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Luke 6 and verse 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And I'd, I'd like to ask those folks who teach an alternative method of salvation to what the scriptures teach, why don't you just do why don't you just do what Jesus says? In Mark 16, 16, he says, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Romans chapter 6, verses uh, 17 and 18, you remember Paul says, but, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you are now committed, and having been freed from sin, you are a slave to righteousness. And all of that occurs in, in this relationship to baptism. Hebrews 5 and verse 9 says about Christ, And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. I don't ever want to accuse anyone who believes that alternative method to salvation from that which the scriptures teach of being insincere. But but if we want to obey him, then very simply we set aside the tradition that we have been taught or followed that, that leads us away from what the scriptures teach and we accept the plain teaching of scripture. It is absolutely essential that someone be baptized. And Peter says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Obedience to the truth purifies the, the soul. So the apostles taught that baptism was essential to salvation. Jesus taught that baptism was a essential to salvation. And again, I, I believe the people who hold this particular viewpoint are sincere and, and may not even know that they're twisting Jesus' words. Yet I, I can't help to think of such people as Paul, who thought of his brethren in the flesh in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. He, he, they have a zeal for God, he said, but not with knowledge. And that's what I lay at the feet of those who have a, a non-biblical view of salvation. You're teaching, I, I appreciate your, v, your zeal in, in God. But you have to teach God's word according to knowledge. And if it's there, accept what it says. Here's the last view, the fifth view. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now that's what the verse says, isn't it? This view takes Jesus' words at face value, and no explanation is necessary. Jesus says what he means, and he means what he says. And we've already seen in what we've studied that one must believe in Jesus, Acts 8, verse, uh, uh, verses uh, 38 and following, and one must be baptized to enjoy forgiveness, Acts 2 and verse 38. In Acts 22 and verse 16, when Saul was given the gospel message, he was told to rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And Peter said to those who came to him on the day of Pentecost, wanting to know what they could do to, to be right with God, he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 and verse 38. So those are the five views. Which view do you hold to? He 
who believes and is baptized will not be saved? Or he who does not believe and is not baptized will be saved? Or he who does not believe and is baptized will be saved? Or he who is not baptized will be saved? Or he who believes and baptized and is baptized will be saved? You see, it should be clear as we look at these five different positions of this one very important verse that there's only one viewpoint that's taught here. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, if you want to study more on this particular subject, if you want more on baptism and its significance, I would really recommend that you go to scriptureSay.com and uh, look at the, the uh, many, many, many articles that we have there. Uh, there's video there, audio there, there's text there. You're free to download it. You're free to print it. You're free. You, you have my permission to teach anything that you find there. So uh, if we can help you, give me a, a, a call or uh, send me an email, and uh, I'd be glad to discuss this further with you. Now, when we come back in just a minute, we're going to conclude with the Gospel of Mark. We'll look at those last few verses. Stick with us. Now here on the, uh, at the end of Mark, the, the Lord goes on to give the apostles certain signs that would accompany them. Here's what the verses say. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. If they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Uh, again, uh, there, are some, there are many different traditions associated with these last few verses, but notice carefully the wording of the promise. These signs are not going to follow every believer as long as the world lasts. That's not the promise here. They did follow the believers in the first century, and the purpose for these miraculous signs, and these are all miracles, were to authenticate or confirm, in other words, the word that was taught. The apostles would, would teach God's word, and then they would confirm that by being able to, to do a miraculous sign. He says in, in verses 19 and 20, So when the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and has sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. And they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. And after that, Jesus himself sent them out through the east and the west to the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. The authentication of their ministry was the miracles that they worked. Something to note in verse 19 here. Very interesting. When the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. He's on his throne now. You notice that? This is consistent with what all the rest of the New Testament teaches us with regard to Jesus on his throne in his kingdom now. It's not something future to our day. He's, he is there now. And Jesus, through the resurrection then, was proclaimed to be God. He's Lord. And as Lord, he calls all men and women into accountability. 1 John 2, verse 3 says, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. 
That's what the scriptures teach us with regard to obedience to him. And now we've, we've spent an entire episode talking about that important subject of baptism. And I'd like to further invite you to, to deeply consider your relationship to him. If you have never been baptized by immersion in water for the remission of your sins, and you want to follow Christ, you need to take care of that. You need to do that now. It's, it is a matter of eternal salvation. It must be done. That's the word that we get from Jesus. Why would we call him Lord, Lord, and not do what he says? I'll tell you why. Because a tradition has been taught that prohibits people from following the simple word of God. And what we're trying to do here on our program is simply share what Jesus says. And you've heard that this morning. Well, um, sadly, that brings us to the close of the Gospel of Mark. It's been a long journey, hasn't it? And I've enjoyed every single episode. I hope these studies have been helpful to you. And next week when we get back together, we're going to go on to an, a new subject. Hope you'll tune in and see you then. We thank you for your interest in what do the scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.